From the first day I played Mass Effect, I always wondered what it would be like to play with friends. Of course, we could watch each other play, talk about how we handled certain encounters, what class we had picked and what our favourite biotic powers were, but it just wasn't the same as standing next to them in-game, fighting down hordes of troops and trying to extract as a team. The first two Mass Effect games were great and truly some of the best single-player experiences of their time, and a well-implemented multiplayer component would have been some great icing on an already delicious cake particularly once Mass Effect 2 rolled around, where the combat was a lot more refined, enjoyable and smooth compared to the first game. There was also some personal pride to uphold. I, and I'm sure many others, often thought we had mastered the combat system, and would have loved to many able to prove it in a competitive setting. I'm sure some people were disappointed when we found out that the first multiplayer mode of the series was going to be a wave defense game, like Gears of War's Horde mode, but I was ecstatic and couldn't wait to dive in. On December 11th, 2010, Mass Effect 3 was announced to widespread excitement at the Sprite Video Game Awards, with a short trailer and an optimistic release date of holiday 2011, instantly later pushed to early 2012. There had been rumours that a multiplayer mode may have been in the works for the next game in the series, and those rumours were confirmed in October of the same year, with a few limited details on a 4 player co-op mode that directly affected the single player campaign. As time went on, more and more information was given out, such as finding out we could play as different classes, face different enemy factions, and that we didn't have to play multiplayer if we didn't want to, and that that decision wouldn't negatively affect our campaign playthrough. A primary concern with a lot of players not interested in multiplayer, as a lot of them had brushed it off as a tacked on inclusion just to move a few more units. If you did play however, it would grant a higher readiness score in single player, which in turn helped your war score increase, something that contributed to getting a better ending to the story. Our first taste of Mass Effect 3's multiplayer came in the form of a free demo launched in February 2012, only about one month before the game's full release. It included a portion of the single player and limited access to co-op, which included a few characters and a couple of maps. I remember finishing up my day at high school, catching the bus and nearly breaking into a sprint just to get home on my computer and play a couple of matches before my parents got home. It's fair to say I was hooked, and at the time, there's nothing else I would have rather been playing. Once the demo ended and the full release came out, we got access to all the characters, maps and equipment. All the main races were available on launch, Human, Turian, Asari, Krogan and Salarian, with more that were added in DLC later down the line, along with all the classes people were familiar with from single player. Inside each class there were characters with their own abilities that varied from one to another. A Turian Sentinel might get tech armour, while a Turian Infiltrator got a cloak field. You could customise further by choosing to take single use power ups into a match, and they had abilities like making weapons deal more damage, or gave you stronger shields. It also gave the option of using get out of jail free items, like a rocket launcher that killed all enemies in a certain radius, the ability to instantly refill all your ammo, or revive yourself without the need of a teammate, though these were limited by only allowing you to take a few into each round, providing you had them in your inventory. These, along with new weapons, attachments and characters, were all unlocked in random loot crates, which granted 5 random items with better chances for higher rarities in the more expensive offerings. Even though a lot of people would harbour some bad blood for this being one of the first major releases to support an RNG based loot box economy, at the time it seemed fair and never did I feel the need to spend real money just to try and get something I wanted and I got the bulk of the characters and weapons I was interested in just by putting some hours into it. The matches gave a decent amount of credits, and just a few of the high difficulty missions would be able to net you one of the best crates in the game. Even looking past more egregious things like weapons having 10 ranks that could be unlocked at random. There were definitely times I was hoping for a new gun, but instead got the same old rifle, except it was one rank higher than last time. It never seemed overly unfair and appeared quite balanced, though I'm sure if there was any sort of PvP mode my opinion would most likely be different. The gameplay itself was quite simple. You and up to 3 other players fight 11 waves of hostiles, with the difficulty ramping up each time. Every few waves would give a mission that had to be completed to continue, with uninteresting objectives such as escorting a drone across the map, or defend a point while a timer ticks down. While they weren't the most creative, they did what they needed to do by throwing curveballs to keep players occupied throughout the match. You might have had a great camping spot, but you'd have to get right out of it as soon as the game asked you to run across the map to activate a drone. When the game launched, it offered a choice of bronze, silver and gold difficulties, 
with the three enemy factions of the single player campaign, that being Geth, Cerberus and Reapers. Each one felt decidedly different from the other, which helped in the overall replayability, along with each difficulty being a decent step up from one another. By the time active development ended, we had received over twice as many maps and characters than launch from DLC packs, plus a platinum difficulty level and a new enemy faction, which saw the collector's return from Mass Effect 2. With these new additions added to the game for nearly a year after its initial release, it kept the mode fresh with something new always being on the horizon. Props to them for releasing it all for free as well. After jumping back into it in preparation for making this video, its flaws are a lot more apparent as opposed to when it was my go-to co-op game over five years ago. The controls can sometimes be infuriating, the spacebar controls roll, sprint and take cover, leading to some annoying moments. The maps are small and can often feel claustrophobic, some of the larger player characters can fill nearly half your screen, 11 waves can sometimes feel like a drag, and sometimes there are nonsense moves enemies make like this. But there are still things that are great as ever, like grabbing an enemy over cover to deliver an instant kill melee, pulling off a massive biotic explosion combo with another player, or just the duo playing with three friends, mowing down enemy forces as iconic races from the Mass Effect universe. I don't know what answer I would give if someone asked me what my ideal version of Mass Effect multiplayer would have been in 2011, but if I did, I think it would have been something like that. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk briefly about Mass Effect Team Assault. This was a prototype created as the basis of a first person shooter and was to only be available as a downloadable title, like how Battlefield 1943 had been when it was released a year or so earlier. This game plays from a prototype build that was created in just 4 months at the time Mass Effect 2 was being developed in 2010. It was however eventually put to the side, but the idea did resurface as the co-op mode for Mass Effect 3. The videos released don't show a lot, just the basic ideas and concepts surrounding the gameplay. There were going to be drivable vehicles such as the iconic Mako and Mantis gunship and weapons like the M8 Avenger. Although it was an intriguing concept, we would never know its full potential. In fact, the only reason we know about it at all is that Bioware divulged the information in the final hours of Mass Effect 3, a video piece released near the end of 2012. I do think the idea was a good one, and maybe one day we'll see it realised in a full product. That is, if we ever see another Mass Effect game at all. Mass Effect Andromeda is a controversial game to say the least. At launch, it was bogged down by extremely questionable facial animation quality in a very public fashion, which saw it become a joke online within hours of it being released. No matter how many patches and updates Bioware pushed, it would never lose that initial impression it made with a lot of people, even though you can play it now and they aren't half bad. Though I won't say they're great either. It's a shame, because the game itself is actually solid. Not a masterpiece by any stretch, but a solid experience, especially if you've already invested time into the Mass Effect universe. And what's especially great about it is the multiplayer. Bioware Montreal is the studio that developed Andromeda, not the flagship Edmonton studio who had moved on to making Anthem. This was their first full release, but not their first development project in the Mass Effect universe, as they had created the multiplayer for Mass Effect 3, as well as some of the single player DLC packs. Because of this, Andromeda's multiplayer is not a recreation, but an evolution, streamlining it to be better than before, and I think they succeeded. One of the most obvious changes to Andromeda was the movement system, adding the ability to jump, dash and sprint in an extremely fluent manner. Combine this with the new dynamic cover system, like what was in place in the first Mass Effect, though a lot better implemented this time, and the gameplay feels incredibly freeing and fast paced. Even the nimblest characters in Mass Effect 3 feel like you're walking through quicksand comparatively once you've played around in Andromeda. It removes some of the biggest complaints of 3's multiplayer. When it got chaotic, you ended up jamming on the spacebar to either roll, sprint or take cover, which usually results in exactly what you don't want to do. However, in Andromeda everything feels a lot more natural. You want to be in cover? Just run up to it and you're there. You need to get out of a situation fast, click a button and dash away in whatever direction you're moving in an instant. Characters like this are what makes the game feel so much faster and less of a slog to play, and this in combination with maps being designed with verticality in mind lend to a lot more fluid and smooth experience. 
I also love how they make the most of this freedom of movement. For example, if you use the melee key while you're high in the air, you'll slam the ground below in a satisfying orange explosion that not only stuns and causes enemies to stumble, but looks awesome in the process. Matches are also shorter, only asking you to complete 7 waves instead of the last game's 11. This adds to the streamlining and pace of the game, making everything feel faster and smoother. Like the previous iteration, characters and weapons are sorted by rarity and opened in loot crates, purchasable with in-game credits or by paying real money of course. The main difference here is that all characters now level individually instead of having all level within one class simultaneously. The good thing about this is that unlike in 3 you aren't faced with leveling up to potentially nearly 10 characters in a class pool every time you gain a level. But the downside is that if you have a few different soldier classes they will all be at level 1 to start with even if you have maxed out another one. They also added a rank system, previously they used just for weapons, meaning if you open a duplicate of a class you already have, it will gain one rank until a max rank of 10. These grant extra points to put into your powers and abilities, but could also be a way to get more duplicates to make people buy more packs. Overall, I think keeping them sorted just by rarity and not by class keeps it from being unnecessarily complicated in a game where the UI can be complex or frustrating enough already, though the chance for more duplicates in your hard earned packs can sometimes leave a sour taste. The weapon system is very much unchanged, guns are again sorted by rarity and have the same multiple ranks as characters when you get duplicates. They do feel more varied here compared to Mass Effect 3 as they are weapons from the Milky Way and Andromeda Galaxies. Milky Way weapons are traditional like you'll be used to from all three earlier games, and ones from Andromeda are a mix of plasma and laser based weapons from the various races who inhabit the galaxy. There is still a variety of mods that can be applied to grant bonuses like extra headshot damage, less recoil, or a scope for higher accuracy. Although I have been praising Andromeda's growth from Mass Effect 3, there is one thing to be mentioned which seems like a step back, and that's the user interface. It sucks, and not just from an aesthetic point of view. Far too many clicks are required to get where you need to go, scrolling through menus can be slow and jumpy, and sometimes it feels very claustrophobic. This contrasts with some great parts, such as leveling up your abilities, which show a video of said ability in action, while clearly outlining the path and details of each skill branch, and opening crates is still as satisfying as ever. This isn't to say that 3's UI was that great either, but it stands out as a part that unlike the rest hasn't been streamlined and still feels quite sluggish. I think the bad press surrounding Andromeda really hurt the popularity of multiplayer, which is a shame as it's a solid upgrade from Mass Effect 3 and you can tell it's been made with some care and thoughtfulness. By having a less engaging single player than previously, the player base has dropped a lot faster as it just couldn't get players interested. Comparing this to 3, which had 5 full fledged multiplayer DLC packs for free no less, which gave new maps, characters and weapons, it's obvious why a lot of people wouldn't stick around. Of course some new content was added to Andromeda's multiplayer but the amount just wasn't enough to make a viable difference. Mass Effect 3 came out over 6 years ago at this point and you can still boot it up and find a match without too much difficulty, but I'll doubt I'll be able to say the same about Andromeda's multiplayer 5 years from now. After some initial scepticism from the community about adding a multiplayer component to a historically single player game, multiplayer launched Mass Effect 3 and quelled all fears about it being attacked on, low effort mode, added just to sell copies. Even now, 6 years later, it still stands as a great addition and fits into the series formula as comfortable as anyone could have hoped. And even though the next game in the series may not have lived up to the expectation in the single player component, the multiplayer was well made and left a good impression to those who played it. I think taking the co-op route was the right move. As much as I like the idea of an FPS from seeing the footage from the cancelled team assault, it would have been difficult to capture the spirit of Mass Effect as well as the co-op can fighting with your friends instead of against them to achieve a common goal. Whether we will see another Mass Effect game at all is up for debate in itself, but if we do, I'll be excited to see what they do for multiplayer, and I hope it can live up to the high standards set by its two predecessors and be worthy of the Mass Effect name. Thanks for watching.